Good day to you all. Today is, September, is January the 30th, 2020. And on September 15th, last year, January the 30th, 2020 is called the day from the calendar of Pope Gregory. Hmm? And on September the 13th of last year, 2019, it's called the calendar of Pope Gregory because Pope Gregory had his headquarters in Rome. And previously in Rome, there was a calendar. The Roman calendar had 10 months. La decima, the 10th month, that's why it's called December, this month. But September, that's the seventh month, la septima. That's why it's called September. On September the 13th of that time, last year, the Continental Commission, Abhi Ayala, we're giving you this message today from the Nawakali Embassy of the Continental Commission of Yayala Embassy of Indigenous Peoples. From September the 13th last year, we emitted a message. We sent a message to the U.S. Congress. We sent a message to the U.S. MCA Working Group and the U.S. House of Representatives, headed by Nancy Pelosi. The message had to do with the systematic negation and discrimination against the rights of indigenous peoples in the U.S.-Mexico-Canada trade agreement, completely ignored. We called for a public hearing on the right of free, prior, and informed consent in the USMCA, and it was completely ignored by the working group in the House of Representatives. On January, excuse me, on December the 19th, December the 19th, Last year, 2019, the U.S. House of Representatives moved their approval. They adopted and approved the text of the U.S. MCA forward into the procedure of going to, procedures of going into the U.S. Senate on December the 19th, the very same day that they voted on the articles of impeachment on U.S. President D. Trump. That same day, December 19th. Then, on January the 9th, on January the 9th, the Senate Finance Committee did the same thing. They voted their approval for the USMCA on the very same day that the articles of impeachment were delivered to the U.S. Senate for the purpose of deliberation and trial on the impeachment of U.S. President D. Trump. On January the 16th, today is the 30th, on January the 16th, two weeks ago, in the midst of all this, the full Senate voted. In the midst of this impeachment proceedings against President D. Trump, the full Senate voted on the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement, passed it and adopted it, and sent it up the line for signature at the desk of President D. Trump. President D. Trump signed that. USMCA yesterday on the 29th. He did the backdoor deal on the side loan of the White House yesterday and only invited his Republican cohorts, cohorts, no? In the collusion and complicity and cover-up that is about to occur once again now that it's been adopted in the U.S. Congress, the U.S. Mexico-Canada Trade Agreement, there's only one more step and that's for the Canadian Parliament to finally ratify it. Mexico already agreed to it. The U.S signed it into law by D. Trump yesterday, and now it's on the table of Canada's parliament. What's on the table of Canada's parliament is the same thing that got here on October the 12th, 1492. The global regimes of colonization, exploitation, and expropriation of the natural resources and labor. Labor is the natural resources. The natural resources and labor of the indigenous peoples of this continent. But they're not coming at us now with colonies. Those colonies morphed after the wars of independence, after the U.S., after the 13 colonies, after the 13 British colonies. You hear a lot of discussion today in the discussions about the framers and the founding fathers, but it's well to know that the original and the, and the, the violation of U.S. domestic electoral and U.S. policies and international relations with the Ukraine, the Soviet Union, 
China. But it's well to note that the original process and procedures of international relations that the U.S. government had in its very first instance an appearance in the international arena when they came from being colonies to being a country was with the indigenous nations. And if you don't believe me, why are there treaties? Why are there treaties with the indigenous nations that the U.S. government is signatory to and they're still sitting there in the U.S. statutes? They're still there archived in their international system. You don't make a treaty with your own citizen. You don't make a treaty with your own subject. You make a treaty with another nation. It's a nation to nation, and it's nations to nations, because just as they became confederated, the 13 colonies went into one nation, we also have our confederations tradition. And just as the nation of the United States became confederated in the League of Nations and then the United Nations as it sits today, we also have our international alliances as original nations of Mother Earth. And that's why today we are speaking out again to let it be known that we will not be silent. And we make it known. We deny consent. The process, procedures, and product of the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement are a violation of the right of free, prior, and informed consent of indigenous peoples, as is articulated in the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples that was proclaimed from the U.N of September the 13th, 2007. Well to remember, the four countries that voted against that declaration, well to remember, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and the United States. Well to remember. What we're seeing here today is that President Trump signed it into law yesterday, huh? This is going to be an international agreement with international standards that are going to apply from Mexico to Canada. And one of the standards in that agreement has to do with the rights of indigenous peoples, not only their resources, not only their right of free power and informed consent, but their right under Convention 169, the Convention on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as Migrant Workers with Families. What it means is this. If the U.S. is going to step into this agreement in the age of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which is now the original NAFTA, North American Free Trade Agreement, 94. At that time, there wasn't the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. At that time, the right of free, prior, and informed consent hadn't even been articulated, much less now adopted at the international level of the United Nations as a standard for all international agreements around the world. In 94, with NAFTA, that wasn't there. The reason that D. Trump was promoting the need to move NAFTA forward was to upgrade it and modernize it. You can't get from 94, the original NAFTA, to 2020 without going to 2007. That means if you're going to get to there and come from here, you've got to go through the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And you have to have recognition. That's not enough, though. Respect, that's not enough either. You've got to have guarantees of protection for the rights of indigenous peoples at the local, regional, provincial, state, county, from the job catcher to the president, and on to the international level, you're going to have respect, recognition, and mechanisms for the full and effective guarantees of protection and institutionalized manner to correct the violations of low rights when they do occur. The rights of free power and informed consent in terms of the protocols that are being violated right now in the Wet'suwet'en territories, where they have denied the TC Energy, previously TransCanada, from entering an invasion into their territory. That's going on right now. And the same TC Energy, a.k.a. TransCanada, guess what? Invoking the principles of international law under Convention 169, which is now going to be applicable from Canada to the United States. It's already applicable in Mexico. There's going to be a level playing field, no? The trade agreement is supposed to create a level playing field, right? And Mexico has a, already a signatory position to the Convention 169 on the rights of indigenous peoples as migrant workers with families. That standard is going to have to also migrate north. And the right of indigenous peoples as migrant workers with families also have to be a standard applied across the board from Mexico to Canada, including the right of self-determination for indigenous peoples as migrant workers 
with families regardless of their status as citizens or subjects of the government which they may be conducting commerce in in terms of exchange of their labor. The right to work is a human right. The right to work is a human right. Today we send this message into all the constituencies of the United States of America so they may stand with us as we move forward in denunciation of the violation of our right of free, power, and informed consent, and also to call you to take into your awareness that though we have been struggling against genocide and colonization for 526 years now, we are determined to carry on the battle and the fight for our self-determination, not only for our own well-being and self-respect, responsibility of being the defenders of motherhood. We carry the responsibility of being the defenders of the human rights of the future generations. And we know that the economic infrastructure, superstructure, that has been fomented by the corporate fossil fuel industry that is driving these trade agreements is not taking it to us to anywhere else but terracide and a complete cascade of collapse of the ecosystems of the planet that it can lead us all, not just the indigenous people, all to the terrible fate, not just of climate chaos and climate emergency, but terracide, the destruction of the capacity of Earth to be the mother to the future generations, in particular us. Just this past month in Mexico, in a place called Bahuatlan, in the state of Puebla, Mexico, the same company, TC Energy, a.k.a. TransCanada, who's invading the territory of the Wet'suwet'en up there in the north, what is called the British Columbia province, is their designation, not ours. In Pahuatlán, Puebla, the indigenous peoples of the Totonaca, the Ñañú, the Otamí, and the Lawas banded together to fight back against TC Energy and beat them back for the pipeline they were trying to put through that was going to desecrate some of their sacred mountains. They just won a decision that forced the Mexican president, Andres Manuel López Obrador, to move the pipeline away from their sacred mountains. They invoked the principles of Convention 169, the rights of indigenous peoples to free, free power and informed consent for projects that affect their territorial rights and human rights as indigenous peoples, but they also made known the statement, although the pipeline may be moved, we're not in agreement with the pipeline at all. It's better that it got moved, but we still don't agree that there should be pipelines coming through our country. And why is this important? It's important because the border wall, what you know as the border wall, the Trump wall, what it is, in the area of Brownsville, Texas, on one side, Coquilla, Mexico, on the other. That's the connecting point for the pipelines that are going to be built alongside of that border wall. The wall isn't being built to stop the people from coming across or going one way or the other. The wall is being built to expand the right of way so the pipeline can go through there that's going to connect the Trans-Canada pipeline from the back and fields through the Dakotas. Remember the Dakota access? You do know that, right? All of that to the pipeline systems coming out of Texas in Brownsville, Trans-Canada, TC Energy got a pipeline in Brownsville that goes under the ocean and comes out in Tuxpan, Veracruz, Mexico, and then heads over Puebla, Mexico. But guess what? That's where they stopped it. They stood up and stopped it. The Totonaca, the Ñañú, the Nahuas. Just like they're standing up there to stopping it in Wet'suwet'en, it's the same company. It's the pipe thing, petrochemical empire, the empire of Petropolis that we're all fighting against. So we say this to you now. Once again, we've been trying to get this message into the U.S. Congressional Representatives, and we have the paper trail to prove it. We have the letters from the U.S. Senators from the state of Arizona to prove it. We have the letters to the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission to prove it. We have the letters to the Nancy Pelosi U.S. MCA Working Group to prove it. We have the paper trail to prove it, that we have been intervening at every step, and we have been shut down and shut out of the entire process as far as command of uh, uh, that the public be informed of their complicity and collusion 
in the violation of the rights of indigenous peoples at the hands of these corporations and in the name of their government. And this is again vitally important today. Now why? Because it's about to happen again. It has already happened. The collusion and the complicity has been happening all along, openly, in you know, front of everything. The, the Trump impeachment, the trade agreement, the smoke screen, the back door deal being done on the side lawn of the White House. Now they say, in the court of common sense, they say this. You can't have a trial without witnesses. In the court of common sense, they say that. And in the court of common sense, they also say, we're all witnesses. We're all witnessing what's going on. And if there's no witnesses in the U.S. Senate, there could be no acquittal. The same principle applies on the USMCA. If the indigenous peoples were basically, if the indigenous peoples were fundamentally shut out of the process and denied a voice the United are standing as the original nation. This is all our territory. The U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement is illegitimate. It has violated our basic human rights of self-determination. And this is the determination that has been made even just recently in Mexico regarding the Maya train project just two weeks ago. One of the courts in Mexico said the indigenous peoples are correct. These projects cannot go forward in violation of the right of indigenous peoples to free, prior, and informed consent. So if this is the first time that you've heard of this, you can't blame that on us. And we've been sending the word to your representatives in the U.S. constituency government all along. As a matter of fact, we've been sending this message to your part of the, of the constituency of what it is our common humanity, how you may identify yourself. We've been sending this message all along since October the 12th, 1492, the fundamental is this, relative. I don't know, your calendar, they call it from the West. We're not from the West, we're not from the East, we're not from the Middle East, the Far East, much less the West. And in fact, of fact, the West is a guest here on this continent and should act according, should act respect. And under that ethic, with that ethic, that eagle that's flying over there, that eagle that's flying up there, trying to make a replica and paste it on top of that headdress of that lady that's sitting on, standing on top of the Capitol. There's an eagle statue up there with feathers, but it's kind of off. The simulation is like these consultations that are going on. It's a simulation and more like a distortion. But there is such a thing as the spirit of truth. And there is such a place where the spirit of truth lies, where it is. It's in the human heart. We have been distortions and distortions, colonization and genocide. The colonizer also has the right not to be a colonizer. I'm going to say it again. The colonizer has a human right not to be. If there's going to be no witnesses, there can be no acquittal. And if there's no testimony, if there's no engagement of the indigenous peoples in the process of the trade agreements of the USMCA, that's not a legitimate agreement either. And if this is the first time that you're hearing that message, it's not too late. It's not too late. And we would only say to close, time is now. Bye.